Welcome to Nick and Dave Deep Dive the Metaverse, a podcast exploring cult classics, subculture, and geek media. I'm Nick. And I'm Dave. And we will be your tour guides for our hot take of Dean Parasot's uh, brand new film, Bill and Ted Face the Music. This is the third movie in the Bill and Ted franchise, and it's accurately um, summarized as once told they'd save the universe during a time of time traveling adventure. I'm sorry, during a time traveling adventure, two would be rockers from San Dimas, California, find themselves as middle aged dads trying to crank out a hit song and fulfill their destiny. So basically, the first movie was the the original where they're met by George Carlin, who Rufus, mm-hmm. and are told they're gonna they're going to unify mankind with the greatest song ever. And then the second movie is them uh, going to hell. There's not really much time travel going on, and it's yeah. really just a super departure. It goes nuts. But Bogus Journey was. Fun. Yeah. And now this kind of goes back to that first movie plot line where they're trying to write the song. But the kind of the twist is now they're middle aged dads. Mm-hmm. They still haven't written the song to unite all of mankind. Their music career went up and is now uh, crashed and there has been nobodies. Yeah. I think that that pretty much pretty much covers that. Yeah, no spoilers there. It's all in the preview. <laughs> That's all in the trailer. Um, well, before we get into that, uh, what have you been up to since our last podcast? Well, this summer has been really warm and really, uh, really gnarly for me. So I've just been trying to make the best of it. Uh, stay inside a lot. Um, but then when there's nice cool days, go out and uh, do something fun outside. I've been doing a lot of landscaping stuff at my at my property uh, in the gorge, really enjoying that uh, that time out there. The remodel is nearing completion, sort of. Uh, we're, we're at least past the, the red tape uh, section. And I, of course, have been playing a lot of World of Warcraft. Man, um, every, every week, War, Warcraft is... Yeah, I say it a lot, but I do it a lot. Um, the gates of Ankaraj are open, and I've been raiding and killing bugs and all kinds of crazy stuff. We have not downed Cthune, if you know what that is or who that is. Uh, we're not there yet, but we will be soon. So what's this new uh, expansion called? It's like Dark something? Oh, Shadowlands. Shadowlands. You're talking about retail. Um, I don't play retail. Oh, yeah, yeah. But that's all right. all of my buddies do. Um, so, so hipster. So yeah, I'm like, well, actually, I only play classic. No, yeah. Um, it's cool. It looks really rad. The the new uh, cinematic trailer is good. Oh uh, yeah. All the cinematic trailers for every uh, expansion are always killer. Um, even Warlords of Drain are arguably the worst expansion of World of Warcraft. Oh, ever. I love all those cinematics. Um, that Warlords uh, cinematic was so awesome. It actually got me to buy it and play it. And then I was like, womp, womp. <laughs> but I think I talked about all that in the Warcraft episode. Yeah, but that hasn't come out yet. Oh, man, you're right. Uh, but when this comes out, that will... No, you're right. Yeah. We're time traveling, Nick. We're like Bill and Ted. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I will talk about my Warcraft journey in the in the upcoming Warcraft yeah, in our episode. next episode. Yeah, so you're gonna you're gonna hear all about how much of a super Warcraft nerd I am. So please excuse me that I bring it up a lot. Okay. So um, what have you been up to? Well, so last weekend, uh, you know, I sort of imagined this uh, this segment being kind of about conventions and events that we went to, yeah, um, which they just haven't been happening. But we've been having some virtual cons, and so last weekend was the DC Fandom, uh, DC Comics or Warner Warner Media's DC Comics branch uh, opted out of participating in Comic Con at home and held their own event. Why? And well. Basically, because they completely got to overshadow San Diego Comic Con this way. Oh, okay. Um, they held a much better event than than San Diego Comic Con was. They had their own website. Uh, it wasn't just like a, a series of YouTube videos. Like it, they made it into a, a 24 hour event. The whole the whole thing ran multiple times, okay. and you could you could tune in and watch it kind of on any of the cycles or bits and pieces of all the cycles. Um, and they showed some really cool footage and trailers. Uh, you know, the probably the the biggest they led with the the Wonder Woman eighty four trailer, okay. which you would think would be the closer. 
uh, but the closer actually ended up being the teaser for the Batman. Yeah, that's what I was seeing all over the Twitter sphere and Facebook, people posting uh, Robert Pattinson Batman stuff. Yeah, it's, you know, it's really weird. Um, it's our cl- the closer of our podcast. We always talk about the different social media platforms. Yeah, and I'm I'm an Instagram guy. Mm-hmm. And after that trailer went up, almost instantly, my Instagram was lit up with uh, fan art of Batman. Like I follow just a ton of artists, and everyone in my uh, in my feed was super inspired by that trailer. And then I went over to Facebook to the sewer of intellectualism. Yeah. And just saw nothing but like really lame uh, Robert Pattinson. Memes. Yeah, Robert Pattinson emo jokes. Like a lot of people must think My Chemical Romance is still a very relevant reference. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm just like, well, I mean, Facebook is for old people. Yeah, I guess it is. Like it's for elder millennials. It's for <laughs> and, it's their, for and their parents, elder millennials. If you know face, you know social a social media platform is over when grandma is on it. Oh, that's true. Well, anyways, I don't want to wallow in that sewer any more than I have to. I prefer Instagram where people were drawing cool pictures of Batman. Yeah, I follow a lot of artists on Insta as well, and but mostly fantasy genre artists and tattoo artists. Mm-hmm. And surprisingly, I got a fair amount of uh, Batman fan art too. Yeah. The trailer actually, like, it looks really good. Uh, I'm still... I might have some Batman burnout at this point. We've had a, just a, a metric ton of Batman movies. Yeah, and I'm a little bit over it. I, I definitely will see this movie, and I think it will be good because Matt Reeves is doing it, and I actually I think everyone involved are, are kind of heavyweight actors. But mm-hmm. it's it's basically, it's gone over into the James Bond territory where it's, oh, yeah. you know, I've got... My cl- like if I do a James Bond impression, and most people, if they do, Sean it's Sean Connery. Connery. I you know my bat or my James Bond is set in stone. My Batman's a little more malleable. Yeah, there's been a lot of Batmans. Yeah. So I enjoy who's all- the best. I who's mean, your Batman? I should say the Batman of my heart is Michael Keaton. <laughs> okay, but uh, I love Ben Affleck's portrayal. Like physically. He embodies Batman in a way that no one else has. I like Christian Bale. Yeah, that's not a controversial opinion. That's like, I think that's... Though, Michael Keaton is the Batman of my childhood, mm-hmm. and so I, I like his portrayal a lot, but I like Christian Bale's Batman. Yeah. Um, well, Michael Keaton and Ben Affleck are both going to be back for the Flash movie. Oh, okay. That's so, cool. yeah. That's uh, it's kind of the running theme of this whole convention was DC's multiverse and this sort of this new philosophy they have that every everything counts. But can we agree that DC is not as good as Marvel in the movies? Just in everything. I mean, but overall, how do you say good is hard to quantify? <laughs> I'm I'm uh, very much a Marvel zombie. Uh, they make Marvel makes up the majority of. In my historical comic book reading, um, DC's highs maybe are higher. I but think I think the DC media- has Vertigo, and Vertigo has always been pretty dope. Yeah, well, Vert- now Vertigo is is no more. Now it's the world of Sandman. Ugh, okay, well I'm <laughs> old, so yeah, DC I- has Vertigo. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Um, so what else happened at that convention? There's a few more, um, the Suicide Squad trailer from James Gunn. It wasn't really a trailer as much as like a behind the scenes, oh, okay. uh, footage. Is that, there, there's, they're making another Suicide Squad? Yeah. I didn't like a, see the first one. It's like a requel. You know, it's, oh, man. you know, where it's, uh, some of the cast carries over, um, but it's a totally new flavor. You've got James Gunn, the director of, uh, the Guardians of the Galaxy mm-hmm. movies, um, and a lot of new characters. Did Hollywood get over him? Like, wasn't he scandaled for a minute? Yeah, he got trolled pretty hard by uh, some some right wing bloggers that unaired or uh, unearthed some unflattering old tweets and stuff from back in the trauma films days. Some some really necro opinions he probably doesn't hold anymore. Yeah, and some uh, more like very tasteless off-color jokes oh, okay. and, and Halloween costumes. Gotcha. Um, and he got him fired from Disney uh, because Disney can't mess around like that. Um, 
And so he was, for a minute, he was fired off of the Guardians franchise. And then Warner Brothers uh, didn't really wait at all to scoop him up and hire him to to relaunch Suicide Squad. To do their stuff. Okay. Yeah. And the first Suicide Squad movie is, uh, I like it a lot, actually. It's probably my favorite of the DC Extended Universe movies. Okay. But I'm not going to pretend it's a good movie. <laughs> and it's another one of these movies where it's a, a little bit of an abortion because it... Uh, got a lot of studio interference and got completely re-edited to make it more punchy and uh, funnier and like less of a, a dark action movie. Huh, they wanted it a little more a little more Deadpool. Yeah, definitely. A little more Deadpool, a little more Guardians of the Galaxy, um, a little less uh, the Dirty Dozen with supervillains. And okay. this is actually maybe ironically very much inspired by the Dirty Dozen. Like the the poster even is sort of an homage to the Dirty Dozen, and they're they're leaning into that to the core concept of what the Suicide Squad is. So, do you think I should watch that for Suicide Squad before this second? Before I don't watch no. the second one? No, I don't. I don't think so you both, should. I should just skip them both. I th- <laughs> I think <laughs> uh, I think probably because you love like most of us do love that first guardians of the galaxy movie. Yeah, it's great. I think the suicide squad by James Gunn is a pretty safe bet. I think it's, uh, it's going to be really good. Um, the, the final one I want to talk about, and this kind of goes into more into that suicide squad, uh, uh, studio interference is the trailer for Zack Snyder's justice league, Oh, which we, we talked about this off mic before that, Zack Snyder uh, had this whole vision for the DC movies, and then he had a, a family tragedy while they were in post production for Justice League, and he had to step away. And the studio brought in Joss Whedon to make an Avengers movie out of it. Yeah, to ruin it. Yeah, and so that has been the standard version of the film up until this point. But because of uh, just overwhelming fan interest, uh, HBO Max is finishing Zack Snyder's version of Justice League, and they're going to release it as a, a four-part miniseries, four one-hour segments. Wow. Do you think it'll be good? I think it will be like every Zack Snyder movie where it's uh, it's beautiful and uh, I'm left feeling unfulfilled afterwards. But I definitely... <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to watching it because I, I love watching his movies. I just never love the movies. No lie, I I skip DC movies because they are so bad in general. They usually don't hit the mark. Um, Batman is the only thing that ever hits the mark for me. Um, I just I just don't like any of the Superman stuff, despite being a Henry Cavill stan. So this I, is a, I was gonna make a pitch that when Zack Snyder's Justice League comes out. We watched the three Zack Snyder movies, Man of Steel, Batman v Superman, and Justice League. And we do we do a deep dive of just those three movies. We don't have to get so into the... So nine-hour podcast? No. We'll do it like we're uh, doing this one, where hopefully it's an hour and a half. <laughs> <laughs> we're but so bad at that. We don't... Um, we don't fully deep dive the first two movies. We just watch them for context. Okay. And the deep dive is focused on the new movie. Okay. I could get behind that. Although a deep dive on a four hour movie is pretty intense, but we can, we can work out those logistics behind yeah. the scenes. Here, Cause here you've never, you've never seen any of these movies. No. So you're coming in Cause clean. I don't like DC. You, you don't like DC, but you're also down on the Marvel movies. So this is the opposite flavor. You the do like is, Henry Cavill. I love geeky stuff. But I don't like pandering bad geeky stuff. Well, then, I like authentic. I like artful, good things. I don't know. It's hard to describe what I don't like about these fake feeling uh, comic book movies. It's kind of like when you when you have a, a really good one, it's like a home cooked meal. Mm-hmm. But when you watch some of these just craptacular things they put out, it's like being served up cold mcdonald's you're like yeah Ugh, it's technically food <laughs> <laughs> well there's a feeling like a lot of these movies are made in a factory right yeah like they just crank them out one no actually like three come out a year and 
they have to hit certain beats. Mm-hmm. Zack Snyder's movies are not like that. Like, because you've seen 300 and you've seen Watchmen. Yeah, those are good. He makes artful action movies, right? Sucker Punch. That we, was fun. Yeah. He's got, a, he's got a vision. And I like, I think I like his artistic or his visual vision more than I like his message. Um, but his movies are always super interesting. Yeah. I, I can get behind 300 and uh, Sucker Punch and whatnot. He, did, he does good movies uh, yeah. to watch. Any, you could freeze frame any Zack Snyder movie at any part and hang the picture on your wall. Okay, maybe not any part. But yeah, I get what you're saying. Yeah. They, they all look really yeah. stunning. So did you have anything else on this whole DC nerd fest before we go into the beer section? Uh, <laughs> no. I mean, the videos, uh, trailers for some of the video games like uh, Gotham Knights and the Suicide Squad Killed the Justice League. Oh. Uh, both look like a lot of fun. I'll definitely play both those games. but For PS5 when oh, it comes out? For sure. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, let's get to the podcast fu- fuel because it's a weird one. Yeah, this is super weird. Um, go ahead and tell us about this beer. So I got a Logical Journey from Modern Times. It is a smoked Hellas lager. And, uh, you know, normally uh, Hellas lager is a very light, clean, um, kind of crystal clear beer. Uh, and this has this oaky smoke character to it. Um, and it's, uh, got, they achieved that through beach smoked barley malt. And I mean, I mainly picked it just cause it was, it was interesting. And I thought the name logical journey and modern times both sort oh, of yeah. fit the theme. Um, and, uh, I'm still kind of deciding where I land on this. Yeah. I think this beer is, um, this beer reminds me of my opinion of kombucha, <laughs> which is tea is good. Rotten tea is bad. Um, I like a Hellas lager. I do not like a smoked Hellas lager. This is not a good beer. Um, I don't really want to finish it. And I do I, have some I have some alternates. Um, I know, and I have some Pelican in the fridge, and <laughs> that's really good. Um, so I am, I am not going to finish this beer. It's the first one that I've... The not, first dud? Yeah, but the thing is, is Nick isn't shopping for dud. Dave's beer taste. He's trying to find an on on topic beer, and he probably knows I don't like um, barrel aged anything. Mm-hmm. I don't like the taste of wood. Uh, that's, <laughs> I don't like the taste of peat. That's why I'm not a huge Scotch or whiskey fan. I like beer more. But anytime you take a good beer and you age it in a in a dank old barrel, it just <laughs> makes it taste like feet. <laughs> And so they've come with all the controversial opinions. I just don't like that. I like a good beer that's done right mm-hmm. um, in many styles. I like. La- I can't think of a style I won't drink, but barrel aging. Well, that's uh, not what this is, though. This is uh, the malt. Is, I know. Is yeah. Smoked. So, so I guess I'm getting a little off the point. They took something awesome and tried to make a twist on it, and it was a big dud. Mm-hmm. Um. I'm not a found, uh, fan in t- general of uh, Rauch beers, uh, smoked beers, and I knew that mm. going in, but I am, <laughs> uh, I'm a sucker for something different. Yeah, so adventurous. even though like the guy uh, at Modern Times, because I went, I went to their location in Portland and, oh, okay. and I got the, the sales pitch from the, from the guy that works the refrigerator. Oh man, I hope he doesn't hear this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was actually, I mean, this was not the beer. It was the beer he started to spiel with, but it was not his strongest recommendation. Okay. But I just, I'm a sucker for the weird. So you say smoked Hellas, and I was like, well, those don't go together. Yeah, that sounds <laughs> like a crazy idea. <laughs> <laughs> so so anyways, this one is probably a little bit of a miss for us. Uh, look for our, our rating of it on on Untapped. I won't, I won't, uh, tank their average yeah, rating so what are you what are you gonna give this bad boy because nick's the untapped uh, operator for uh this podcast and probably, is it, is it probably, out of four stars or out of five stars? it's out of five and i'm probably sitting at a three five I'm right now at a two yeah I, I, if i right. won't finish the can that can't be a three because a three is just a medium journeyman okay level beer yeah but you gotta take in, and maybe we're spending too much time here, but you've got to take the the style into uh, 
into account. It's listed on their on their website as a smoked beer, so it's it's a Rauk beer, and this is one of the better Rauk beers I've had. Okay, so I mean, I guess if you drink something you know you're not gonna like, it's not really fair to tank it. It's like grabbing a a big uh, IPA and then tanking it because it's hoppy. Yeah, you're like, oh, this is so bitter. Yeah, you're like, well, yeah, it's an it's an IPA. So I'm sitting at a, a three five, but I could even go higher, even though it's not either of our favorite. I could go with a three, I guess, in context, a three. But you know, uh, that's that's fine. Not every beer is going to be awesome. Otherwise, why rate them? If if we just, love you, modern if, times. If you just love everything, why rate them? Yeah, I'd like to try more of their their other beers. Um, this was clearly an adventurous idea for them. Not nobody would make this their flagship. Oh, for sure. Well, let's take a break and get back with our spoiler-free assessment of Bill and Ted Face the Music. All right. Welcome back, divers. Let's get into this. Well... I really liked the first two movies just from kind of a, a campy um, appreciation of comedies, appreciation of ridiculousness. And um, so when I heard that the third one was being made, had mm-hmm. been greenlit, I was I was really uh, I was really stoked on it. And um, I kind of came into this with really high expectations, oh, did I you? guess. Um, because Keanu Reeves is not known for making poor movies these days. All That's of his true. movies are all, they're always really good. Even bad Keanu movies are good. Yeah. Like well, early, throughout even, his even, career. Even bad Keanu movies are watchable. I'll for say that. sure. Yeah. And in the modern times, he's kind of a mega star. Mm-hmm. He can, he can just do what he wants. And so if he's going to do a, uh, a Bill and Ted movie, it's got to be good. And um, Alex Winter is is really, in, you know, he's not hurting. He's not um, needing to do this. He's doing all right. He's, uh, yeah, his, his post Bill and Ted career has been mostly behind the camera. Yeah, he's been doing a lot of production and a lot of stuff. And um, I've always really liked Alex Winter uh, ever since Lost Boys. Oh, for sure. Um, Mulleted and, Vampire. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh, shout out to Marco. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, I love that movie. And mm-hmm. I would love to do that one. That's a cult classic. We should, oh, we, should oh, we definitely it. should do Lost Boys. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Um, anyway, so I was stoked on this movie. And um, I had high expectations. And when I f- started watching the movie, I got... I felt a little let down early on when I was just like, oh man, this feels really try hard. Yeah. Um, but then I, th- I started thinking about it being a little retrospective or introspective. I think all of the movies are try hard. <laughs> Even the first one. <laughs> they go ham. Yeah. Yeah. And so maybe I was, I, I had to, I had to reset my mind somewhere near the middle and to be like, okay, this is how it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be extra. Yeah. Um, so these movies are like the original movie came out, uh, when I was in middle school, I think, uh, and 1991. No, that was bogus journey. 88. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, is it 88 or 89? It, that doesn't matter. It, uh, it came out while I was in middle school and I remember wanting to see this and, uh, my parents not wanting me to see it because they had a habit of, of forbidding movies that they thought were stupid. Okay. And and so I really wanted to see this movie for a long time, and eventually a, a, an older relative intervened and talked my parents into letting me watch it, like renting the videotape, and then getting to go see Bogus Journey in the theater. Nice. And um, I just, like, glommed onto this as my new identity, like... I, this movie made a huge impact on me. Oh, yeah. I mean, I was in middle school, too, and I remember doing the whole Wild Stallions thing <laughs> uh, with my friends. That, yeah. I, that was that was totally a thing. Yeah, we've quoted these movies for years, and, I mean, I hadn't really watched them uh, for, like, at least a decade, you know? So it's just off of all those old viewings. Yeah, I feel like between 
uh, the original uh, Bill and Ted movie and Wayne's World. Mm-hmm. It was like like thirty percent of my vocabulary <laughs> in, as a kid. Yeah, and um, it's interesting. You know, we use a lot of uh, of big words, and I I would say that it it's fair to say Bill and Ted probably has a an influence on that. And I'd say Bill and Ted uh, has an influence on the name of this podcast even. Uh, it has that same rhythm. I'm, I'm sure, at least even maybe subconsciously, we were inspired by it. Oh, yeah. We definitely like that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And when we were coming up with our name, I think that having our names and then another statement, definitely mm-hmm. it jives with the Bill and Ted thing. So I'm glad that we decided to do a hot take on this. Um, I really, I watched a interview mm-hmm. with Keanu and Alex Winter um, about that was done about a week ago. Mm-hmm. So it was just prior to launch, but the reviewer, the interviewer had seen the movie, a press yeah. copy. And they talked about that. They actually said, um, when they were first auditioning for Bill and Ted, mm-hmm. they said the auditions were crazy because they were like marathon auditions. Yeah. And um, every, every teenage actor probably in Hollywood is there. Yeah. And what they said made their performances different than a lot of other people's performances is they weren't trying to be funny. They were delivering the lines and the big overstated dialogue, like the, mm-hmm. the overly large words and whatnot. They were delivering them with seriousness mm-hmm. because they both have theater backgrounds. Yeah, And so they were trying to um, make the characters have gravity that was sort of internally consistent. Like, they didn't find themselves to be ridiculous. Yeah. Oh, totally. And that show, like, they kind of, they pl- even though it's goofy, they're, they're playing it straight. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're doing crazy things, but th- to them it's not crazy. And mm-hmm. so that makes the movie more entertaining. And it continues into this, this third volume of the series where Bill and Ted are having these conversations with each other. And they... They're a little bit off the wall, but they they make sense from the perspective of these characters. Yeah, and uh, you know maybe I'm I'm sort of the opposite of you in that you say you came into this with very high expectations. Mm-hmm. I came in with pretty low expectations, honestly. I, kind of that that there's no way that you can go by go back and get a third bite of the apple like this. Oh man, and um, I think they did like. Oh, I la- sure. I laughed through this whole movie and um it felt like a, a, an enhancement to the mythology like it it wasn't uh just a, just a profit grab it was really like a nice like conclusion to the story. Yeah, and that was one of the things Alex Winter who is m- way more vo- verbose than Keanu mm-hmm. in that interview. Um one thing that he said was um, they didn't want to do the movie if they were just doing it to do it. Yeah. They wanted it to be awesome and they wanted it to be um, worthy of the legacy and of the fondness that they felt for it. They didn't want it to be something that would um, cheapen the series in the end and end up um, making them unhappy that they, they had done it. Yeah, something that really kind of stuck out to me um, is that it feels like you're getting the grown-up version of Bill and Ted. Like it's they are in sort of a arrested development state, mm-hmm. but they have become adults and they don't seem like teenagers anymore, even if they do still seem like Bill and Ted. And yeah, I think that sure. that's down to uh, the writing from Chris uh, Matheson and Ed Solomon, who have written all three movies. Yeah, and those guys were uh, evidently the the genesis of the Bill and Ted uh, shtick. Mm-hmm. Was they did um, they did like stand up open mic stuff, and this actually originated as a bit that they would do. Yeah, it was like an improv thing that they that they did characters that they had. Yeah, and so they've really. They've really put a lot of themselves into these characters and into the writing, and it shows. I'm really glad that this was done by the original creator. I creators. I hate it when properties get handed over and mm-hmm. passed around because then it never feels right. 
Yeah. Oh, totally. Kind and of like the old guard. Like that. That property felt right because yeah, the original the, guy did. The original writer is still handling, and he's got yeah. the voice. Yeah, I thought that was really interesting. And if you watch interviews with with those writers, um, they have a Bill and Ted banter with each other, like the oh, way the sure. way that they speak. And I don't know if if you and I watched the same uh, interview. Were they included in the in the no. panel? Okay, so I watched the the Comic Con panel. Um, that they did and uh, they were talking about the first time that they saw Alex Winters and uh, and Keanu was like in line at a at like a fast food restaurant while they were doing all these auditions Mm -hmm. and Keanu and Alex were in line ahead of them and they had already just sort of clicked with each other and they had this sort of conversation while they're watching these two kids um, ordering McDonald's or whatever it was and they're like these are the guys that should play Bill and Ted. Yeah. And then it turns out like these are actually some of the guys we have auditioning to play Bill and Ted. Yeah. And it's crazy how their friendship kind of blossomed because, um, they both went to the auditions riding motorcycles. Mm. And so they walked in with helmets and they were like, Oh, you ride a motorcycle. And they started talking. And then they, they started talking about, Oh, this is about guys in a, in a rock band. And they're like, I play bass. And he's like, I play bass too. So they're both bass players who Mm. ride motorcycles. So they have this in common and then they just kind of, you know, hung out and jammed and played around and just became bros. Just clicked up with each other. Yeah. And they've been friends ever since. Um, So in uh, in the interest of keeping this popping and and getting onto the the more fun spoiler filled segment. Yeah. What's your uh, do you give a, a thumbs up or thumbs down for Bill and Ted? Totally thumbs up. If you like Bill and Ted, watch this. This this is um, as good as Bill and Ted's Excellent Adventure, slightly better than Bogus Journey. And I liked Bogus Journey. Mm-hmm. So I definitely think this is worthy. If you're a Bill and Ted fan, or even if you've never seen any of the movies, um, this is a really fun comedy, and I, I enjoyed it. Yeah, it catches you up to speed in the, the sort of opening voiceover even though dave doesn't like voiceovers no i don't like voiceovers. um i think this one was done really well and effectively to tell you the story fast and ca- catch you back up um and i think this movie does a good job uh of maybe writing some of the wrongs of the older movies having just rewatched them there's there's a uh, there's some homophobic stuff that doesn't age well mm-hmm. and um there's, I mean, there's not a female character with agency at all in either of those movies. This is definitely a product of the modern times yeah. where we're a lot more um, socially conscious in general and trying to be a little more uh, representative in general. And, and I think they do a good job without hitting you over the head with it. Yeah, definitely. I think it, it, it organically... Uh, write some of those things. So this is definitely a recommend from me as well. All right. So I guess between us, that's uh, that's two thumbs up. <laughs> yeah, that's not our brand, but yeah, we'll, no. we'll use it. <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's take a quick break, and then we'll come back with a spoiler filled uh, discussion of this. It's not a deep dive. It's just going to be some impressions. But if you haven't seen it and you plan to, maybe stop the podcast, watch the movie, and come back to it. Welcome back, divers. Let's get into this spoiler-filled hot take of Bill and Ted Face the Music. Well, the first thing that struck me about this movie was they used no makeup or Hollywood trickery in order to try to de-age these actors. They looked old. Yeah, they're what, in their late 40s? In the movie, but in reality, they're in their 50s. Are they that much older than us? Okay. Um yeah, they look their age. For sure. Um, which, you know, it actually is pretty good for their age, honestly. Oh, for sure, yeah. Um, they're both, they're both uh, doing real good. But the, um, there, was no, there was no trickery there, and it kind of opens up with that voiceover, and you're in a weird wedding scene. And I, 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 we're not going to do this beat by beat, mm-hmm. um, but I wanted to remark on this wedding scene because 
in the original movie, there's that the weird the character who his his dad's young trophy wife. Yeah, Missy, who is this uh, a girl that they went to school with, who's now married uh, at that point to Bill's dad. Yeah, and there's it's a wedding scene for Missy and what is it, Bill's and Ted's brother, Ted's Deacon. brother, and so this lady has married. Uh, married around the family and it's super awkward and at first i was like oh my god this is so cringy like i don't love cringy scenes in movies Mm -hmm. um and then with the kind of like gratuitous making out kissing between the uh, the brother and i was just like oh man why did you why did you make a directorial decision to start the movie like this I so I love this because I love the the journey of of Missy throughout throughout the four movies, um, three movies or three movies. Yeah, sorry. Unless you're counting the cartoon stuff, but we didn't even get into that. I only count the first season of the cartoon. Oh. <laughs> the the first season of the cartoon where Alex Winters and Keanu Reeves actually do the voices, and they have George Carlin and George Carlin. Yeah, the second season. And the live action TV show are non canonical, but that that first season is I, sure. I think that's worth it's worth watching. It's amusing. It's all right. Yeah, you go go find those DVDs for what <laughs> they go. They probably go for a lot on eBay right now. Yeah, but anyways, I I like the journey of Missy, um, and it it almost I I wouldn't call it a redemption of the Missy character because she has traded places where she was. Uh, the prey and has become the predator. <laughs> oh yeah. You know? She's definitely the cougar. Yeah. And, um, it, it does seem like throughout the entire movie, her and her new husband, they seem very happy. And they're like in the scene with the instruments and stuff, they're playing music together. Yeah. And it does, it doesn't seem like lame or cheap. She, she definitely is no victim in this, but I just thought to myself, God, why did you decide to make this the opening scene? Um, well, I think it's it's the opening scene because we're reestablishing the dynamic of the family, and then we get where Wild Stallions are right now as a band. Oh yeah, and we're... we get this just honestly like awesome song. I love I love this well, song so I much. I mean, it's got a theremin and throat singing and they're using looper pedals in order to play different instruments to layer a, a weird song. Uh, it, it feels like, like, uh, electronic world music. Yeah. Oh, totally. Like, and, and I'm there for it. Like, I really, I like that song a lot. I thought it was, I thought it was good. It was better than I thought it would be. I thought uh-huh. they were going to try to have Bill and Ted do a really crappy song in order to, uh, established that they were just beyond the pale. Um, but actually they made a pretty good song. It just was totally out there. Yeah. I think the idea is they're, they're burdened with terrible purpose, right? Like Mm -hmm. they have this destiny foisted on them while they're teenage delinquents and they just are always trying to live up to it and they're never, never reaching it because it's unattainable. Yeah. That, that is one thing that really stuck out to me was that this movie tries to paint the picture that being told that you're going to do something amazing is actually a curse because then you're consumed by doing that thing. Mm -hmm. And Bill and Ted literally have spent their entire lives trying to fulfill a prophecy that they can't seem to fulfill. Yeah. They can't, they can't get there and it's taken a toll on their relationship and we, they go to, to couples therapy, Yeah, but in, in classic Bill and Ted style, codependent as they are, they don't realize that they're supposed to go as separate couples and they end up booking uh, like a double session and they they both show up with their wives the princesses the princesses who have been i think recast in every movie they're the only yeah. only characters that don't uh you know don't get re uh don't reappear as their original actors yeah the the whole family dynamic so we're we're trying we're going to talk about this in three acts basically beginning middle and end and in the beginning they're establishing basically that Bill and Ted have good families. They Mm -hmm. have, you know, their wives in general. Uh, Their their relationships are strained with their wives, but they have, they each have a daughter. Mm -hmm. um, What, Billy and Thea? Yeah, which 
again, uh, I'm no fan of the crybaby man children on the internet that mm-hmm. have a, that have a problem with uh, them being girls. Oh yeah, that doesn't bother me at all. Grow up. I was totally fine with them having daughters, and I was totally fine with them having kids. The thing that I kind of felt was a little bit um, square peg round hole was that they had the girls do all the time traveling stuff when that was generally the Bill and Ted um, Bill and Ted role, and that was that was kind of their thing. That was well, they're they're. They're on two simultaneous time travel journeys, right? Like they're they're uh, sure. both they're both uh, on their own quest through time. It definitely felt like there was a um, they tried they wrote three para, they wrote three plots mm-hmm. and they just kind of walked you through all of them. The first one being the girls time traveling finding a band, mm-hmm. the um, Bill and Ted um, time traveling trying to talk to. Uh, future them in order to get the song that had already been written Mm -hmm. and then the third plot was the the hell uh go to hell speak with death do all that stuff Mm. um that was the that was the extra piece so i don't i don't consider that the 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 c plot i think is the princesses and their journey through time but that's barely touched on i know but that's that's just how these movies treat the princesses um to me there's an a and b plot that come together when okay and they kind of they kind of do that when they meet up in hell yeah but we're getting way yeah we're getting way so if we're talking about establishing setting Mm -hmm. one thing that um i didn't love um was that even in the future Mm -hmm. we're Humanity is ruled by disappointed boomers. <laughs> Why? That is really isn't that funny? That's um God. I was just like seriously an old person telling everyone what to do. It's like it's I mean, we're we're in the thick of the presidential election now where we're mm-hmm. looking at two people on the verge of eighty uh to be our our uh, our leader here in the u.s and i'm just thinking to myself like why did they have to do that yeah so as bill and ted they leave the couple's therapy um it didn't go well and they get visited uh by christian shawl playing kelly the daughter of rufus and she takes them to the future where they meet the great leader uh played by holland taylor and she uh, is Rufus's wife, and she lays the the trip on them that that time's running out. They need to write the song in the next seventy seven minutes, and that's mm-hmm. what really gets the the plot in motion. Sure, and they, she gives them uh, Rufus's old pocket watch. Yeah, well, Kelly gives them that. Uh, oh yeah, you're the right, great you're leader right. gives them uh, a bunch of guitars and is like, "Get to writing," mm-hmm. uh, which is where Bill Ted has the bright idea to go. Uh, and travel to the future with uh, to a future version of themselves after they've written the song, get the song, and then go back and perform it. And that's really what sets our, our time travel shenanigans in motion. Yeah, so uh, that's basically the beginning. Yeah, and, and then, then the... Like, on top of that, the great leader just doesn't trust that they're going to do what they're supposed to do, and she sends some sort of Apple Store Terminator after them yeah. to, to kill them. He's definitely an eye Terminator. Yeah, and um, so they're being pursued through time by this uh, this off model Terminator and uh, tr- trying to find uh, the per- like the the song that's going to unite the world. And then the girls go on their uh, on their mission which is through time to assemble the perfect band to mm-hmm. to play with the Wild Stallions to to record this song. And just from a musician standpoint, she they chose almost all lead slash melody instruments. <laughs> That's true. Yeah. And I was like, a lead flute, a lead guitar, a lead trumpet? Come on now. Well, that's the problem with the super group, right? Yeah, yeah. everyone is a lead something or another. Even even death, who becomes their bass player, yeah, is uh, a lead bass player. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, which which is ultimately that that was the thing that broke up the the Wild Stallions, right? Is that that death was showboating? So yeah, forty five minute bass solos in the at every show. Um, something I really liked was when they're time traveling, mm-hmm. how they kept the the feeling of the circuits of time 
but with updated graphics. It's yeah. still a bunch of tubes just through like it's through the Al quantum Gore's realm. Internet. <laughs> yeah, it's a series of tubes. Yeah, I like that too. I was noting that when I was watching it. I, I thought, wow, this reminds me of the old one, but it seems really cool. And there's a scene in there where they're um where they're going and uh they're in the SWAT truck mm-hmm. through the t- the time tubes or whatever. I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah. I, th- I had a good time with that. Um, so the, as we just alluded to, Bill and Ted are kind of chasing themselves through time to try and find this song. And they keep finding progressively worse versions of themselves. Yeah. Just like garage band version of themselves. And then, and then scammer liar versions that, that set up Dave Grohl's house. Like it's their house, but, yeah. um, they're trying to trick them into using Dave Grohl's song. Yeah. Cause Dave Grohl apparently wrote a very good song that they think could be the one. Yeah. And so they, they uh, try to give a CDR to to Bill and to the younger Bill and Ted to get them to uh, go back and play that song and use that to unite the world. Uh, but then future Bill and Ted end up in prison and they're all jacked and, and covered in tattoos. And they oh, yeah those those muscle suits that they were in were hilarious. Oh, I love that. And they're playing this song. Um, and this is a little uh, a little head in my notes, but the, the the lyrics it was like hopeless, hopeless, dying death. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I love their prison song. Like they're they're yeah, doing it's like, like a chant. Yeah, it's all the prisoners chanting while they like pound on the equipment in the yard, and it's just like it's so dark and and ominous sounding, and uh, and I just love that. I love all of the interactions between Bill and Ted and future Bill and Ted. Oh yeah, for sure. When uh when when our Bill and Ted Prime, I call them, when Ted uh turns around and he calls uh, future Ted a dick and he's like, "You want a piece of me, Ted?" <laughs> <laughs> and they're like they're going to fight with each other. Oh, I I just die laughing every every single time. I watched the movie twice and that oh, one wow. uh gets me re- really good. Yeah, I really liked the the future Bill and Ted's. I honestly found that plot line to be the most entertaining plot line mm-hmm. of it all the the time time traveling bill and ted is the gold standard for yeah. me and i loved it it was it was really fun and and i mean they're getting tra- chased down by the by the uh, terminator thing apple and, store terminator yeah apple store T- terminator tm um, that's my tm <laughs> that's not there <laughs> and he uh he ends up chasing them to uh, a place where they what they meet up with their daughters and the band, yeah. So the daughters go on their parallel journey, right? Mm-hmm. They they get the they get the the modern time machine from Kelly, who's who's rebelling against her mom. And it's just a it's like a pod. It's not a. It's no longer a phone phone booth. booth yeah. yeah, we've moved. Phone booths are obsolete, even in the future. And so they go to assemble this perfect band and they go, of course, you start with Hendrix. Mm-hmm. It's an obvious one. He uh, apparently hasn't changed since the Monterey Pop Festival. He's still wearing that that yellow blouse and vest. Oh, yeah, um, for sure. So it's he's instantly recognizable. Um, but he's not he's not buying it. So they go back to get Louis Armstrong, a young version of Louis Armstrong, uh, in order to persuade Jimi Hendrix, um, which I love that that guy. um I can't think of the actor's name, but he was in the the Luke Cage show. Uh, Jeremiah Kraft that's playing Louis Armstrong. Mm-hmm. I, I love him as doing this impression of Louis Armstrong. I I really dig that. But anyways, they go back and get Hendrix, and then they go through history, picking up other famous musicians like yeah, uh, like Mozart and and some prehistoric musicians. A uh, a flautist called what Ling Long and uh, some sort of prehistoric uh, drummer lady. Yeah, like... Uh, Grom or Gronk or something. Yeah, so, so, <laughs> somebody who who's using bones to beat on, like... Grom, yeah. Uh, hide drums and stuff. Mm-hmm. And, and so she's the greatest drum, drummer of all time. Yeah, so they get this band together, come back to San Dimas in the modern time, um, and they're ready to record the song, but the the dollar store or not dollar store apple store terminator is there and he accidentally lasers them and sends them to hell yeah he kills their family and their entire band with his laser Mm -hmm. and it's funny because at that point he has like this weird like 
he starts to have a breakdown. Yeah, the he has a consciousness. He's not just an android or whatever, uh, or I, I don't know what the right word would be. Uh, he's definitely an android, but he's self-aware. Yeah, and he has this. Uh, he has a breakdown, and he just sort of becomes his own guy. His name is Dennis. Yeah. So he's still on the hunt for Bill and Ted, and he follows them to the future because they have gone. Uh, they follow the advice on that pocket watch that Rufus gave them. They go to the end of the story because uh, sometimes the story doesn't make sense to the end. Yeah. And so they go to themselves while they're kind of in their deathbeds. Yeah, I actually kind of felt like that deathbed scene was a little long and gratuitous. Like, oh, did you? Hugging, like Bill, going really getting hyper emotional with Bill. <laughs> so that's like a thing. This was something because I just rewatched all these movies and it was something that uh, my wife, Lisa, she said, I really want in the third one for them to uh, to be able to show emotions without uh, calling each other a homophobic slur, uh, which was something in, in both the other movies. They would hug and then break away and say the word and um, they weren't able to access that. So I, I really felt like that the Bill and Ted Prime coming to terms with the older Bill and Ted, like that was uh, sort of addressing that. Like it was showing that that personal growth that they needed to show. Sure. I, I mean, that's good it, that they were able to do that. But I kind of just felt like that scene was just a little draggy. Just a little too long. There were a few scenes in the movie. Um, this I is mean, not, it's not a long movie. It's over, only an hour and a half. Yeah, but I mean, that that scene was just kind of like, uh, I don't know, I don't. I don't really need this. Kind of like the wedding scene with the hmm. making out with the brother and stuff. I'm just <laughs> like, Ugh, I don't need this. I can just get with the get with the plot. I can get past some of the the flawed things in the movie, uh, but don't make me sit here and uh, sit through Bill crying on Bill's shoulder. Hmm. Okay. I mean, that's mm-hmm. fair. So they they get uh, a flash drive with the song on it from from the old Bill and Ted. Yeah. And they uh, they go outside, and the the ladies have stolen the time machine. As we as we hinted, the princesses go on a sea plot that we don't really experience, because um, they're supposed to be uh, traveling through time to find any any place or any alternate timeline in which they actually are happy in their marriage. Yeah, and uh, the spoiler that is revealed right then and there is there are no timelines in which they are happy. That well, that's that's the premise. That's the premise anyway. That's what the burnout future Bill and Ted told them. Yeah, but I mean, ultimately, since this is the spoiler-filled version of the discussion, is that they determine that their actual, their prime timeline, the, that's where they're happiest. Yeah, it's very zen, right? Like, sure, the current moment is the one that matters. Yeah, and so when they, you know, they come back to the main timeline, that's when they discover that. Um, but anyways, Bill and Ted, now they've got the song, but the time machine is missing and, uh, the robot shows up and he's going to laser them. He's going to laser them, but they have the song. So he has a, a real conflict because the whole, if they have the song, there's no reason to kill them. Yeah. And the whole reason, I mean, we didn't explain this is the reason why that the Terminator thing was sent to kill them was because the prophecy was not completely clear. Some people thought that. Bill and Ted would write, Rufus thought that Bill and Ted would write the song that unites uh, the world. And there are other people that think that Bill and Ted's death will be the event that unites the world. Mm -hmm. And so at this point with, with them having the song, then that, that refutes the idea that it's their death that brings everyone together. Yeah. So the Apple store Terminator decides he's going to kill himself But Bill and Ted need to get to hell to rescue uh, the girls, and so they kind of hop on his suicide. They they jump on him as he as he self terminates. Well, they they break the 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 flash drive because they're like, oh, we have the song. He's like, oh, then I don't have to kill you. And he's like, but we need to die so we can go get our girls. And so they're like, okay. And they break the thumb drive. They're like, well, now we don't have the song. Now you have to kill us. Yeah, but he still won't do it. Yeah, because he's having a crisis. Yeah, he's he's gone way off way off the reservation, and he's not he's not dealing well with it. And all three of them end up in hell. 
yeah. which is everyone's a little confused about how a robot can even go to hell. Yeah, like one of the <laughs> funnier scenes was when they're walking through and they're these demons uh, and they're like, a robot in hell? How does that even work? Yeah. Uh, and when, when the, I actually laughed out loud when those two demons kind of look at each other and say, that's a robot in hell. And I yeah. was like, okay, yeah, this is, this is fully absurd. Uh-huh. This is, this is beyond like, we're, we're not even going to get into the nuances of how actual time travel could, they could have solved their own problem and how time can't be a problem. <laughs> a, a deadline can't be a problem if you have time travel. Well, there's, so they explain it just a little bit. And you never want to explain time travel more than just a little bit. Sure. But that them, essentially Bill and Ted the in the prime timeline mm-hmm. are the center of the multiverse, right? Like where their timeline is a, is a fixed point that overlaps through all timelines. Sure. And so where they are at in it, its relationship to the future stays constant. Um, which, yeah, maybe that doesn't make sense, but it, it is the reality of the, or it's the paradigm of the story. Well, yeah. And then they kind of explain it later near the climax when they're talking about how, um, there is, it's not just a singular flow of time. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, there are infinite universes and people Mm -hmm. and it is not, there is no, there is no, uh, it's not linear. Yeah. Well, it's very, uh. Marvel multiverse, right? Like yeah. you have infinite timelines, but there are const- constants through the timelines. Like the Infinity Stones are the constant through the timeline in the Marvel movies, right? Sure. San Dimas, California, in our present day, is the Infinity Stone of their <laughs> <laughs> of their universe. Like Bill and Ted are that thing. So getting back to where we were, even though we said we weren't going to do a walkthrough time wise, we're doing an accelerated walkthrough. Yeah, they have a <laughs> they have a scene in hell where they realize they can't get out of hell, so they have to go talk to Death because yeah. Death lives in hell. He's been demoted um, for helping them last time, and they kicked him out of Wild Stallion. Yeah, he's like, what What are you going to do? Sue me again? <laughs> yeah. yeah, it talks about. I was just reminded of it's like very spinal tap in mm-hmm. how they they have their cliche rock and roll excesses and stuff. I really, I really enjoyed that. Um, but ultimately, with with Billy and Thea's help, they convince Death that um, yeah, you know a, they should he should rejoin Wild Stallions, and it, it's Death uh, again played by William Sadler who played him in Bogus Journey, um, and he Death is the is kind of the straight man to Bill to Bill and Ted's buffoons, mm-hmm. right? And you you get the the band back together, and it it really is satisfying when they all they all come back together. Yeah, and and it was it was cool. I I enjoyed that part. Um, there were a few moments in there where I was a little, um, I don't know, I I was a little bit ho hum on the acting in mm-hmm. uh, particularly the I, I don't I didn't look up her name. I'm sorry, the actress that played Thea. I felt like she was really she had done clearly done some really in depth character studies of bill or of ted Mm -hmm. from the first movies and she was miming his every gesture and physical body language and whereas i think that that's admirable for an actress um i have never met a kid that perfectly mimes their parents Mm -hmm. they don't want to be their parents at that age and so that's samara weaving um who's like hugo weaving's niece or something like he's some she's some relation to him i really don't think that the billy and thea actresses are going to be super proud of these roles in 10 years um because they just it's they're playing caricatures with somewhat throwaway characters um and that's not where you want to make your stamp yeah well yeah i mean they really are doing an impression of bill and ted yeah it's like let's do a teenage girl doing an impression of old versions of Bill and Ted. Mm-hmm. It was it's very meta, and I don't think that that's where they're going to want to hang their hat. Um, but on the other hand, it's not really a role you pass up. 
Yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's, uh, um, they're very young ladies and probably have long careers ahead of them. Sure. For sure. Especially given the, you know, the connections and the, um, the, you know, relationships they established making this movie Mm -hmm. that's going to go a long ways in Hollywood. But I just kind of thought during that scene that it sort of showed that they were doing, um, juvenile impressions, I guess is the thought that came to Hmm. my mind or impressions of juveniles, juveniles doing impressions of juveniles, (laughs) I guess. Okay. I I mean, that's, I don't think that's exactly unfair. It's, and let me, uh, let me caveat that by saying it by no means ruined the movie for me. Mm -hmm. I'm just being critical because that's what I do. Right. Oh yeah. We're not, we're not here just to lavish praise. This is our, our hot take. Yeah. And that was a throwaway moment, just like the deathbed scene and the wi- and the wedding scene. Throwaway moments. Hmm. I think, yeah, that's fair. If if you feel that way, I didn't necessarily feel uh, the same way. But I think that comes down to probably uh, your high expectations and my low expectations. Probably is that uh, since my expectations were low, they were exceeded. Uh, and since yours were high, maybe they didn't always reach the bar. Yeah, for sure. So, I mean, just kind of moving on, they get the band back together. Death helps them get the whole band, uh, all of the people that Billy and Thea had, had brought with them. And, and we didn't mention it before when, when, uh, when the robot had, when Dennis had lasered, uh, the daughters and all that, they also, um, lasered bill's dad no ted's dad ted's dad yeah uh chief logan got zapped um during the the standoff at the dave Grohl estate yeah and and so they have a big swat van and they're all in it and death uses his magical death powers Mm -hmm. and time travels them or no it just takes not time travel dimension travels yeah out of out of hell and into uh i mean a literal hell if you LA have been traffic. to la traffic yeah they're out at at uh mile marker 46 uh in between uh la and san dimas california as you're, you're driving out there to the inland empire um and just totally stuck in in that los angeles traffic i like the inland empire by the way like i spent last summer a friend had a wedding there i mm-hmm. like that area a lot i have a lot of uh childhood affection for that family out there um i mean and technically uh san dimas is in the san gabriel valley and is not not is not in the inland empire it's still in the la metro bubble technically mm. but no one from la would call it that yeah, yeah. i was in temecula which is fully inland empire. yeah fully out there yeah it was nice there and the people were nice too anyway moving on <laughs> <laughs> um yeah it was uh it was it was what you expect. I mean, it's crazy. They they decide and somewhere they pick up um, what? Oh man! I oh, Kid re- Cudi. Yeah, they pick up Kid Cudi, who is he's displaced in time. He's a he's a, a casualty of the timeline unraveling, and he gets bopped like boop out from <laughs> uh, on stage playing a concert and finds himself out in San Dimas, California. And it turns out he is an expert on quantum space and time. And that sort of fits Kid Cudi. He's he's a very kind of nerdy rapper. Um, and I won't I won't spend a lot of time on him, but I, I love that album. Uh, Kids See Ghosts is really good. Hmm. I, I was not uh, familiar with him, but it's not my genre. So mm-hmm. no, no surprises there. Um, so they're, they move a flatbed truck and they're gonna, they're gonna set that up as a stage and then they start making a big racket mm-hmm. and time is running out and there's no song. They have nothing yeah. to play. They don't have a thing to play. Um, and, uh, Bill and Ted finally have the epiphany that probably the viewer had, um, as soon as, uh, the great leader said a song by, uh, Preston Logan, yeah. is going to unite the world. It's actually the girls that are, are going to arrange the song. Yeah. And so the girls don't consider themselves musicians. They're these sort of Uber record store geeks that know every, every track on every record and, and do sampling on, on, you know, with loops and stuff, but don't think of themselves as musicians, but it turns out they're actually pretty good at arranging music. Yeah, they they have the expertise, and so they're they're giving directions to all these 
uh, players to kind of, uh, you know, like they, they correct the drummer and have her do like a nice, like four on the floor beat that yeah. can be followed. They kind of, they give her a B, a BPM to hit and let yeah. her jam and then set, you know, set the bass line up with death. They tell him what to play. And yeah, then, they're like, how about that one intro or outro from Too Pale to Cry? Yeah, and <laughs> and so like they put together a song the same way you would if you were building beats. Like they both have like a drum machine that mm-hmm. they work with. And, you know, and they put it together with samples, right? Like they're like, well, here's the drum beat we want to sample and loop. And here's the bass line. And, and they start assembling the song. And Bill and Ted uh, go about... Uh, traveling the infinite multiverse and giving instruments to everyone. Yeah, and Ted says such something, you know, he says, like, we're actually infinite beings. Yeah, he says that to, to Deacon. He says, I'm essentially an infinite being. Yeah, yeah. and they give, they give music, they give instruments to everyone in every timeline, in all places, in all times. Mm-hmm. Um, and, a, and a time signature to follow and a, and a key to be in. Yeah, and so then everyone in all places and all times plays a song together, and it unites humanity uh, and, and saves reality. Saves reality, and it's kind of a big, giant, cheesy climax where you know they hand the reins over to the daughters, the wife, the wives show up in their time machine, and they they realize that they're in the right place with the right people, mm-hmm. and Bill and Ted come in and they start playing some uh, juicy licks on yeah. their guitars. Um, they get the nod from Hendrix. Yeah. Uh, which, I mean, you, it doesn't get much better than that for a guitar player, I'm sure. sure. And then it gives Hendrix the chance to go off the wall because he's no longer holding the song down. Yeah. He's got, a, he's got some rhythm guitar players and he can just start <laughs> really going wild. And then it just kind of, I mean, that's kind of the end of the movie. Is yeah. It all comes together and it all, it all works. And... There was a really nice uh, one of the the girls. I think Thea kind of gives the the explanation. She says, "And so it wasn't so much the song that made the difference; it was everyone playing it together." Mm-hmm. Which again, this is a really Zen thing. This idea that uh, yourself is an illusion and everyone is part of the same the same collective universe. It's that yeah. realization that brings everything together. It's a really positive, maybe. Maybe it's a cheesy message, but as bleak as stuff is in the real world, I'm I'm ready for the cheesy message. It actually resonates more. Yeah, I mean, and it's a message that's useful in the modern day. With exactly. Hyper partisan politics and all of that. So I guess kind of my wrap ups on this. Oh, did you stay to the post credits? You never. No, I never. You did. never watched those because okay, there's a nice did. little, a nice little stinger at the end with the old bill and ted jamming together one more time in the oh. in the old folks home and it's really it's just cute it's just a cute ending oh okay well that's nice it's like bill are you dead yet dude <laughs> <laughs> so i feel like this movie was written uh, the plots was were written by the numbers um it was very very much let's have a let's have time hopping parents Mm -hmm. uh talking to themselves um so time hopping dads time hopping moms let's go ahead and have the kids assemble the band let's have a climax where we do the the feel good reveal that the kids are the ones that do it and it's really all about all people um and, and just have everything be a, a happily ever after moment. I don't feel like there were any, um, there weren't any big twists that threw me for a loop. The most, uh, the things that actually made me laugh at the absurdity of it mm-hmm. were like the things surrounding the robot and the things surrounding death. So how do you? I mean, Dennis, Dennis Caleb McCoy is that yeah, is that what it was? Um, the robot wore thin for me very fast. I thought he was pretty funny, and as far as things go, like I, I, I liked the idea of an irritating um, self-aware robot. Mm-hmm. But I think this actually goes back to the idea that I run uh, tabletop games, I run role-playing games, mm-hmm. and I play irritating sidekicks like <laughs> with you guys. Yeah, in our game, like I'm the one who always has these absurd absurd characters that come in and are yeah. just sort of have a minute. So Dennis Caleb McCoy, he's played by Anthony Kerrigan, who I, I'm a big fan of this guy. 
Um, and you would reckon he's like this bald headed young guy. He played uh, Victor Zaz on Gotham, which I don't think you ever watched. Nope. Um, but he's a really good character actor and he plays very strange, uh, strange character. Did you watch Barry? No. Oh, cause he's like a Russian hitman on Barry and he's really good huh. in that too. Um, anyways, yeah, I really like that actor, but Dennis, the character wore thin for me. See, I liked him and I liked death quite a lot. Oh, I thought I lo- that character I, was really funny. And, I love William Sadler's death. And, um, Keanu and Alex both had nothing but praise for, for that actor. Mm-hmm. Um, they, they basically said he's a, he's a comedic genius and an acting, uh, savant and they look up to him as an actor. Yeah. It's so weird because, so he's doing essentially this like impression of, uh, this German actor, uh, Binked Erkrot from the movie, the seventh seal, mm-hmm. which is like a 1957 movie, um, with Max von Sydow playing chess with death. Hmm. And so he's sort of doing this parody of that version of death, but it has become this thing that's uh, maybe outshadows the, the parody has outshadowed the original in its own way. Interesting. So I guess my, I guess my criticism was that the plots were really simplistic and I feel like you and I could have plotted this movie out. Um, and we're not movie writers. We're we just be. nerds. I think we could. Uh, yeah, maybe, <laughs> maybe. Um, but honestly, I don't think that that's totally a bad thing, that it was simplistic because I was very entertained throughout the entirety of it. Um, and I guess uh, I, the only bad thing was that it was expensive. <laughs> oh, yeah. So we should we should take a second to mention that. So this is a new release movie. That That's why we're doing this hot take and re- and dropping it like days after the release. That um, should be having a theatrical run and is technically having a theatrical run, but because it's the time of COVID and most theaters aren't reopened, at least in the big markets. Yeah. So here, um, there are some theaters in the deep suburbs that are open, um, but in general, this movie wasn't playing anywhere around, and we wouldn't want to be inside a theater with a bunch of coughing people anyway. Yeah, no. This so is we had to uh, do this video on demand for like what twenty four dollars. It was twenty five to buy, twenty to rent. Yeah, so you might as well just spend the extra five and keep See, it. See, I thought about that, and I actually went with the twenty because I thought to myself, I would pay four bucks to to buy or rent this, which mm-hmm. is what we normally pay like right. for Ghost in the Shell or whatever. Um, I would pay that for it, but I don't think I need to spend the extra five bucks for this uh, because that's like a whole other movie. Not that I'm pinching pennies or anything. It's just a matter of, it's like, how many times am I going to watch Bill and Ted face the music? I know my wife's probably not going to want to watch it. <laughs> she didn't. She saw me watching it and didn't join in. Yeah. So I'd say this is maybe something I wasn't aware of uh, because I think uh, as a kid, many of my f- female friends enjoyed this movie. Mm-hmm. My wife was very adamant, like even though she laughs at parts of it, she said she did not feel like the target audience for this movie. She said it's a, it's a boys club movie and she That's doesn't, true. she doesn't feel like it's for her. Yeah, I agree. Um, so let's go ahead and try to wrap this up with some ratings. You can give your final thoughts and then we'll do our ratings. Um, I, th- I don't think I have anything else to, to say, um, that's really pertinent to the movie. I mean, I could talk about Bill and Ted, the universe for a long time, but yeah, I think we've, we've, uh, we've covered everything. Okay. So what kind of a rating would you give this movie? Uh, you know, I'm at a, like a three, five. Okay. So it's as good as Dune. I, or no, uh, Dune is a three, right? It's Dune, I think was three, two, uh, uh okay. three, two, five. Um, We'll have to listen back to so that. So it's better than Dune. I think it's better than Dune in that I think it achieves its vision, which okay. Dune, Dune did not, which that that's what gives Dune that low rating. Is this, is this better than The Old Guard? No, but I think I went higher. I uh, think we did go higher. I, I went 375, uh, verging on a four for Old Guard. Yeah, I think, I think you ended up helping me revise mine up too. So I went three and a quarter stars on this yeah. movie. Um, I initially said three, mm-hmm. but then I thought I actually really enjoyed it. 
and I would pay four bucks to buy it, rent it again if I felt like seeing it on on Amazon, and that's pretty good. Yeah. So I guess uh, it's a little bit above that. Three is what I consider to be decent movie. Yeah. It's a little bit better than that. I definitely wouldn't call this an amazing movie I'm going to rave about or go, you know, when I talk to friends or family, be like, hey, man, have you seen Bill and Ted? Yeah. It's not going to be like that. No, to me, they're probably all three movies or three, five movies. And it's just sort of like, especially if you grew up on these movies and Mm -hmm. and really loved them. This you are the right age now to experience this one. Like maybe you, yeah. maybe you have kids, and maybe you aren't living up to your expectations <laughs> of your adult life. Yeah, maybe your life sucks, like Bill and Ted. No, <laughs> probably not. But I think their life's pretty good. Honestly, it actually, yeah, they have nice houses and nice instruments and stuff. All right. Well, I guess um, that's a wrap on Bill and Ted. We'll come back with our final segment. <laughs> Welcome back, divers. We're in our final segment where I ask Dave, what are you into right now? All right. Well, I mention it pretty regularly, I think, uh, but I like Dungeons and Dragons. <laughs> <laughs> and You don't mention it as much as World of Warcraft, oh, but you true. do mention it just about every episode. It's just about. Well, you know, I spend my time, I spend a lot of time working on those uh, campaigns and stuff. Anyway... I chose to talk about a specific book this time because um, Wizards of the Coast, who uh, publish Dungeons & Dragons, just put out a teaser for a brand new book called um, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. Mm. And this is kind of like uh, Xanathar's Guide and and all of that. This is next level Xanathar's. If you like that book, this is this is going to be the business. This falls into the um, the I guess the spirit. This is the spiritual successor of Unearthed Arcana from first edition and second edition, and then they had another version of Unearthed Arcana in third edition, and then in second edition they called it the Player's Option books. So basically, the idea behind these books are that they. Um, They're optional add-on expansions that give you little rules modules to replace certain things or just add certain things that didn't exist before for total customization. And this can be really fun uh, in a group that is that is focused on um, just telling the best, most customized story. Mm-hmm. And I'd like to think that our our group is pretty into that. Some groups are super power gamey, and they'll data mine these books for the more optimized choices. And if that's your jam, cool. Play the game however you want. That's the point of it, right? It's a it's a it's a mind's eye uh, game, and there's not a wrong way to do D and D. As long as everyone's having fun, you're doing it right. Right. And so this book introduces um, 22 new subclasses. So like, uh, you know, Rogue has Assassin, Thief, Scout, Mm -hmm. Swashbuckler. This introduces 22 new ones for all the classes. And it reprints some other ones from small niche uh, niche books. I actually had to look up that word. How do you uh, pronounce it? uh, For an argument recently. (laughs) Um, Anyway... uh, there is a uh, lost. Oh, I did. Um, uh, so now I say it the bad way. Um, there, like things like um, Blade Singer, right? Mm-hmm. Which is a book. For, it's a class from Forgotten Realms. It's a mm-hmm. wizard subclass, and it's kind of like a wizard who uses a sword. Mm-hmm. Usually, it's like an elven cultural thing. Um, they're reprinting that, and that hmm. doesn't. That's not one of the twenty-two. That's that's in addition. In addition. They're yeah. reprinting things from small books you may not have, um, and then they're doing some cool things like they're adding in optional class features that you can just straight up replace things from. So, like Ooh. if you're a monk and you don't, and your your monk order wouldn't have stunning fist, mm-hmm. which is a basic monk power. I'm just making this up. They haven't teased any of yeah. this. Uh, they'll have a variant. So instead of Stunning Fist, you can have some other monk ability that just hot swaps in. Oh. Um, And they're doing this for like all the classes for various replacement things uh, so that you can play a super custom version. And now 
uh, near and dear to Nick is mm-hmm. uh, racial custom stuff. Oh, they're yeah. doing away with, or not doing away with, they're giving the option to do away with cookie cutter. This is what all elves have. This is what all dragonborns have. And they're making a system called the lineage system uh-huh. where you create your lineage of elves or dragonborn or dwarves and you all have these traits and they're chosen from a group of traits so that you can actually customize uh not every elf is like this like why does every elf know how to use a longbow sure a stereotype yeah. many elves know longbows. <laughs> it's like why because legolas that's why yeah but what if you skipped longbow training and instead spent extra time in the library and learned the arcana skill for mm-hmm. example you can you can customize your race uh totally and completely down to the point where they're saying you can move where your racial bonus stats go oh, completely. Wow. Like you don't have to be a charismatic dragonborn. You could be a wise dragonborn. Yeah. Um, so that is that is near and dear to me. So I've been made aware of there's certain role playing stereotypes, and I, <laughs> and I fall under this umbrella uh, called snowflake. Oh yeah. Where I always do this, even when there isn't like there isn't rules that that make it easy to do. I always am. I'm a big well, what about this, and why can't it be like this sort of player? And we just homebrew it up, because Nick doesn't min-max. He's not a power gamer, so I'm fine with changing yeah. things. These things usually end up detrimental to me. They're not yeah. They're not actually advantageous, but they just get me in the right place for the story I want to tell. Yeah, and so they're, they're doing that with every race, and along with that racial customization, they're doing away with... Um, negative stereotypes uh, for certain demi-human monstrous races. Thank you. Yeah, like orcs and goblins and stuff. They're trying to do away with some of that that typecasting and some of those things that are just kind of distasteful and mm-hmm. and they're you know like painting these things as inherently evil. Like dark-skinned elves are always evil. That's dumb. Why does dark have to be evil? Um, they're, they're getting rid of, they're getting rid of that nonsense and reprinting a lot of the other, like small, lesser races that I say lesser in that lesser played, Mm -hmm. like most people don't play goblins, but you can, um, they're, they're putting those in there and they don't have stat penalties uh, anymore. They, and they will have, you know, they're not inherently evil. They're just, they are what they are. They are goblins. They have a different culture. And so they're trying to make the game more, uh, more accessible, more modern. Mm-hmm. They're very aware of the complaints that people have traditionally had about the fantasy genre. And they're really trying to correct that. Yeah. And this book, Tasha's Cauldron of Everything is a huge expansion, uh, um, in that direction and i'm i'm all for it and if you're not for it that's fine it's optional yeah. nothing replaces anything this is not a new edition of D. yeah you can't you can't have your childhood ri- ruin, uh, ruined contrary to popular belief when yeah. something new comes out it doesn't actually affect your old memories yeah, and and I love this because like my wife plays a cool tiefling character who is from an established lineage of noble tieflings mm-hmm. that all have a specific look and have a very specific style and this lineage system would perfectly customize so she could make her lineage her house. Yeah. And I want everyone to be able to do that. Your your character would be totally custom. So this book is going to be just huge. Um, I've already pre-ordered it on Amazon, but uh, don't hate. I'm going to buy a second copy from a from a local game store because they have an in-game, uh, they have a, a brick-and-mortar store only variant cover. They do this Ooh. with most of their expansions, and it's really cool. So I'm going to go to a local game store and buy that. So then- why do the pre-order then, though? Why... Uh, uh, why not just pre-order it at your game store and just get the one copy? Two reasons. Uh, the Amazon copy is going to be cheaper. They mm. always discount them. So it's, it's a $50 book. I'm probably going to get it for like 30 Okay. It's going to be my second copy, which I like to refer to as the player copy. Oh, yeah, that's true. I, I usually keep a player copy of most vid- of most important books yeah. on the table so when for you, you say, guys. Um, can I do A or B? And you'll look it up and hand the book over. Yeah. 
And then I'll have the pretty copy that I buy from one of my stores, Dice Age, Guardian, and Mox being the stores I consider my stores. Mm -hmm. Um, Portland Game Store? Oh, uh, disrespectful. It's not that I dislike them, but I never found myself in uh, North Portland. I was always down there near um, near Guardian for my band studio and stuff. Yeah, that's true. So it's just a proximity thing. And besides, the people at these three stores have treated me right. Yeah. So... um, I, I will buy one from, from one of my stores, and then I'll have my DM copy, the pretty one. <laughs> <laughs> the one that looks nice on the shelf. Yeah. Well, that all sounds good. I think that sort of thing has been a long time coming. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, D&D makes no, uh, makes no illusions that it it is very inspired by the Tolkien world. Oh, for sure. And I think as time has gone on, uh, and especially uh, Warcraft, the influence of Warcraft has has become bigger and bigger. People's ideas about these races has changed and become influenced by th- properties like that. Yeah. And a lot of people play Horde and play in those races and like, don't play evil. Like, why can't you play Thrall, a truly noble shaman of the orcs? Yeah. Yeah. If orcs are inherently evil, that's that's just not even an option. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that that is the game catching up with the players in a lot of ways. So that sounds really cool. Yeah. So I'm super stoked about it. It's coming out in November. Um, and as soon as it's out, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see what I can do about implementing some of the stuff in, in my own game. And uh, I don't want to do a full rewrite of everything, but I'm just going to see if there are some changes we've already made that we can just sort of realize through these new systems. Cool. So uh, what are you into right now? So I'm going to do something a little unorthodox and do a follow-up to a previous what am I into right now. Oh, man. Because I what am I into right now uh, previously about Ghost of Tsushima uh before I really even got deep into it, right? Like I had just started playing it uh, and now I completed the storyline just a couple days ago. Awesome. And um, it's a mixed bag. Like uh, I'm not completely satisfied with everything and and we'll find out maybe some of my criticisms aren't completely fair, but I do feel like uh, addressing it a little bit more because I thought it was, I thought I was playing uh, Samurai Red Dead and maybe it was a little bit closer to playing uh, Samurai Skyrim or maybe even Samurai uh, Assassin's Creed. Oh, okay. Interesting. Um, yeah. So it's a little more linear than you had hoped? It's a little more linear, a little less self-influenceable. Um, your, your choices don't matter as much as I expected them to, like it, it kind of makes a big deal in the, in the beginning about, you know, the honorable path or the, the path of the ghost. Mm-hmm. Um, but ultimately there, there is only one main storyline and you can't really change it. You can change the very ending of it. You have two choices when it comes down to the last mission. Um, but your storyline is more or less on rails through the whole thing. Can you finish it as a just a true ghost, like a bad guy? Um, that is really the only option. Oh, you can't be a good guy. You cannot be a good guy. There's certain story beats, um, and let's just go ahead and, and spoil it. You get deep into poison and, and, and really dishonorable uh, ways of dispatching your enemies, oh. and you cross some lines that can't be uncrossed. And you can't. You can't just say, just from your own role play perspective, I will not use poison. No, I mean, not in. It's it's a key point of one of the mains, like the hinge of the the end of Act Two, okay. that you poison the Mongol army. Well, that's b- a bummer because, I, like we discussed before, I'm, I'm looking at getting one of these new uh, Fangle consoles. Yeah, um, playing that game, and I really liked playing the game, and I don't. And so this is why I say it's a mixed bag. The game, the game wasn't the thing that I thought it was, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but it was completely the thing that it wanted to be. And so it, it's that's why I say it's a mixed bag. I, 
it's not if you want an ultra customizable where every choice you make makes a difference in the story it's not that game and if you want a world that feels like almost alive like the way red dead 2 does um it's not that game like just for instance uh the horses don't like the animals there's no animal or there's a very limited animal ai like in red dead my horse like my main horse that i played through most of the game with had a very specific personality that was different from all of the other horses that I interacted with. And uh, the animals on their own do, like, they basically have their own game, like the same way that the NPCs do. Like, if you just go and sit up on a ridge and just watch the animals in the valley, they're all interacting with each other in sort of natural animal ways. Like there's a pack of coyotes and the cubs are playing and the adults are hunting and it's like, they're acting like coyotes. Um, Foxes are a big part in Tsushima and every single fox is the exact same animation. Like they all do that. There is one fox that you meet, you know, 13 or no, 33 times. Man, that's a bummer. Yeah. So I think it's just that my expectations got too high. Um, you wanted it to be all these. Other, you wanted it to be Red Dead Skyrim in yeah uh, I, medieval Japan. Yeah, I wanted all of that, and it just didn't end up being that thing. And so I ended up feeling disappointed, but I feel conflicted about my disappointment. Like it was not fair for me to feel that way. Yeah, like you hyped it too hard, and then it 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 was what it was. Yeah, and what it was is an absolutely beautiful game that is so much fun to play. Like it is so much fun to square up and have like these samurai duels. And it's Mm -hmm. got like this Kurosawa mode where it's, it's black and white and looks like it's like shot on like 70 millimeter film and, um, is just gorgeous. Like the game is so beautiful and I do still recommend it, but you need to mitigate your expectations for what you want it to be. All right. Well, I mean, maybe I'll give it a shot. Maybe I won't. But that that's a little bit of a bummer. But it, it does still sound like a really fun game. Oh, and all of the side stories, I just absolutely loved. Uh, particularly, uh, there's this character, Norio, who's a, a warrior monk, mm-hmm. who you alluded to. I play a warrior monk in, in D&D. Um, and so actually, like, seeing that um, sort of the basis for my character, seeing it realized... Uh, like this and played so well by Earl Kim. Um, I, I just love watching him just like cut down Mongols with his Naginata. It's so, <laughs> it's so epic. Nice. His, the range on that thing is just absurd. He just like does these big swipes whacking so many guys. It's awesome. <laughs> nice. Well, I mean, I'm glad that you, you, you've managed to find some enjoyment despite a little bit of uh, disappointment. Yeah, just a little. Sorry. All right. Well, I'm going to do our call to action. We're asking that you subscribe to us on your favorite podcatcher and rate us generously. A five-star review costs you nothing, but means everything to us. You can find us on all social media platforms across the metaverse as Deep Dive the Meta. Uh, Dave likes Twitter. I prefer Instagram, but we're also on Pinterest, which nobody likes. Well, I guess this is really goodbye. Don't say goodbye. Say good journey. Bye.